habe ich eure Aufmerksamkeit. Sieht so aus. Yeah. Ja, ich heiße euch ganz herzlich willkommen in der Wahlkampfzentrale der Piraten Berlin zu unserem Vortragsabend heute, unserem äußerst illustren. Ich bin Dennis Sabin, ich bin der Direktkandidat der Piraten für den Stadtteil Lichtenberg und äh, habe heute die Ehre, hier die Anmoderation zu machen, wo ich gar nicht so genau weiß, warum eigentlich. Danke. <lacht> Dankeschön. Ähm, heute Abend äh, lautet das Motto der Veranstaltung, ähm, ihr habt uns das Internet kaputt gemacht, wir machen uns ein neues. Das heißt, wir werden heute über... Ähm, Vorträge und Beiträge hören, die sich äh, mit Ideen und technischen Lösungen auseinandersetzen, die quasi ein dezentralisiertes Internet anbieten ähm, und diverse äh, Tools äh, vorstellen, um quasi diesem ganzen Überwachungskram ein bisschen zu entkommen. Ähm, wir haben sehr viele äh, illustre Redner dabei heute. Äh, ich freue mich sehr, dass Christian Rothoff von der Technischen Uni in München heute bei uns ist. Wir haben Carlo, dem wir heute diese Veranstaltung zu verdanken haben. Carlo von links, einen schönen guten Abend. Des Weiteren haben wir noch Richard Stallman, ist der Präsident der Free Software Foundation, der heute auch den Weg zu uns gefunden hat. Ebenso von der FSF ist nochmal Thorsten Grote hier. Herzlich willkommen, Thorsten. Schön, dass du wieder mit dabei bist. Hallo. Und last but not least äh, ist sogar Jack of Apple auch heute bei uns. Einen schönen guten Abend. Ich will gar nicht so viele Worte verschwenden auf Deutsch, weil ich jetzt das Ganze noch mal einmal kurz in Englisch erzählen muss. Also heute, äh, wir fahren zweigleisig, ja? also äh, es wird äh, ein Teil äh, der Vorträge in Englisch gehalten werden. Ähm, und äh, dann zu Teil 2. Yeah, dear ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, I'm happy to uh, welcome you to our um, campaign headquarter here in Berlin-Lichtenberg. I'm Dennis Sabin, I'm the direct candidate for the upcoming general elections in September. And I'm um, really glad that you find a way here. It's hard to find, isn't it? <laughs> um, tonight we have an uh, extraordinary uh, event with some really um, um, can, could, could I say famous people? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of what we are going to do tonight. Um, the main topic is uh, you broke our internet, uh, we built ourselves a new one. A new one. A new one. Okay. <laughs> That's how I should pronounce it. Um, Uh, the idea is to present uh, solutions for a uh, decentralized um, network topology and um, um, a new setup of conditions to uh, connect ourselves in a digital world. And um, as I said before, we have some uh, really special guests here. Christian Grothoff from the Technical University in Munich is here and Carlo from from Links, who uh, is responsible for the event tonight. Uh, we also have Richard Stallman from the Free Software Foundation and Thorsten Grote also from the Free Software Foundation Europe. And last but not least, uh, Jacob Appelman. So uh, I don't want to waste words um, and hand the microphone over to Christian Grote. Thank you. Um, let's start by uh, saying the premise that I'm sure everybody here agrees on, that we all have secrets, right? There are business and trade secrets, political opinions, and of course illegal activities. And in this context, I like to refer to the example of you maybe saying something about the time king of Thailand that may not be nice. And if you do so, that's illegal now. And maybe if you see, say something nice about him, that will be illegal in 30 years. Um, so watch what you say if you want to never do anything illegal. So we'd rather keep these things sometimes secret. Now, how do we keep things secret online? Well, baseline, as we all know, is encrypted. And the uh, next best thing that's used these days is, of course, to hide the metadata, so who is talking to whom. And I'm sure uh, you can ask Jake uh, more about that later. Uh, and we all know what's the practice today. Uh, it's pretty much, you know, send everything to the United States in plain text. 
Well, that was kind of okay until we heard that you know the NSA likes to look at that data. Big surprise. Uh, and the companies were willing uh, to give it to the NSA. And of course, uh, they looked at it in real time, at the historic data, and at pretty much everything they could get their hands on. And we learned that this was only a tiny part of what they were doing. Again, to some of us, not such a big surprise. Uh, when the US found out, well, they mostly discussed that this was a problem for their citizens. Uh, who here is a US citizen, except for Jake? Okay, so they didn't care about you. Now, the rest of us still would like to have some privacy left, right? Um, now how bad is it? Well, we know that uh, they, collect, uh, they, uh, they collected 2.3 billion records in the US and 97 billion records worldwide in one month. So, small collection. Uh, we know that they like to collect data in Germany because that's where they collected most of the data in Europe. Uh, but there's good news. Uh, especially for Richard, they were using free software for this. <laughs> and maybe we can do something about that. Now, where were they collecting data? Well, the, today, uh, the slide you might have seen already, right? they have their collection services everywhere. And uh, Jake characterized it very nicely yesterday, saying that's effectively Google for a global TCP dump. Right? We can't get all the data to the NSA, so we just find it wherever it is and make it indexed uh, and searchable and uh, well, can look at everything there is. Now what's this data being used for? Well, uh, one thing to keep in mind is there was this little thing uh, called the war in Iraq where they specifically spied on the United, uh, States, uh, United Nations Security Council members to convince them that the Iraq war was a good idea. And so they were spying on diplomats to create a war, or create support for a war. So this is pretty serious, I would say. And it goes further. We now know that the United States has a policy of cyber war. And this is, in some sense, for me, one of the most significant revelations. Uh, and it hasn't gotten that much press compared to the others. Uh, so let's look at this, really. The effective, offensive cyber effect operations can offer unique and unconventional capabilities to advance US national objectives around the world with little or no warning to the adversarial target and with potential effects ranging from subtle to severely damaging. The United States government shall identify potential targets of national importance where OCO can offer favorable balance of effectiveness and risk compared with other instruments. Now, if you read this, it's very clear. This is not about national security, it's national objectives. So national objectives include things like economic well-being, right? Or maybe being re-elected president. And so they are developing capabilities to infiltrate our computers, exploits, listening in our conversations for national objectives. Now, one way to interpret this is to look at, you know, say, um, insider trading on stock markets. That's the ultimate insider, right? It's a very new way of thinking of the information economy. They have the insider information. If it's in the national objective to further the economy, they'll do it, if the risk is low. We know that US companies provide internal information to US secret services to help them with that. So they give them access to the technical specifications but also vulnerabilities that they have found in the proprietary software are given first to the US government and then maybe eventually disclosed to us. Now, these companies that do this, they don't do this because they've been compelled, but because they get access to intelligence information in return. Now, this is again not, let's say, uh, about security or terrorism. This is about economic advantage for those companies. Again, we have seen this in the past. Echelon is a well-known example where they used a spy network to spy on European and German companies to find out business secrets and, well, destroy European business deals uh, and create patents and block entrance to markets for European companies abroad. The damage was estimated in 1988 already to be about $8 billion per year. 
by the Max Planck Institute. So this is pretty serious numbers, uh, given that you, you know, we have a budget for research in Germany of about $2 billion a year on the federal level. So that's $8 billion in damages on that. Now, so how does the react? How does the European Union react to learning about prison? Well, they said direct access of U.S. law enforcement to the data of EU citizens on servers of U.S. companies should be excluded unless in clearly defined exceptional and judicially reviewable situations. Okay, so direct access. Okay, well, the NSA said the FBI is a proxy, so that's no longer direct access. Uh, clearly defined? Well, define it as always. That's clearly defined. Uh, exceptional, well, we are doing the war on terror, it's all exceptional. And judicially reviewable, I'm sure you've heard about the FISA court approving everything always. Uh, so but they already satisfied that. Now, the US doesn't just limit itself to monitoring or exploiting zero day bugs, they also just directly control key internet infrastructure. So, with IANA, they control number of resources for IP addresses, uh, the domain name system, uh, uh, with the root zone for all of our name resolutions, the DNSSEC root certificate, which is supposed to secure name resolution, uh, most of the X509 certificate authorities that are used to secure HTTPS transactions, um, as to say, let's say do serious business in the US, are headquartered there. And of course, most of the major browser vendors are also subjected to, to, US, to US jurisdiction, and they get to pick whose CAs get shipped with the browsers. Um, so, you know, they control these things as well. And this is our public key infrastructure that we're using every day on the web. And if that's compromised, just encrypting your sessions doesn't give you anything. Now, many of us, is there a political solution? And I'd like to remind you that when uh, uh, James Clapper was asked, you know, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? This was in this March month where they collected, you know, billions of records on American citizens. He just said, no, sir. And that was to the U.S. Oversight Committee that was supposed to control his work. So if the spies lie like that to their political oversight bodies, when our guys go over there and say, hey, please stop doing that, and they say, okay, we'll stop doing it. That's not a promise you can do much with, right? So really, uh, negotiating with the U.S. and getting them to stop, by right, you know, having them say so, is not going to get us anywhere. Worse, in some sense, is that, of course, the EU has supported this in the past very aggressively. So there uh, was a report to the European Parliament from a European research body, which said that the EU has secretly agreed to set up an international telephone tapping network via a secret network of committees established under the third pillar of the Maastricht Treaty, covering cooperation on law and order. EU countries should agree on international deception standards to cooperate closely with the FBI. Right? Network and service providers in the EU will be obliged to install tappable systems and to place under surveillance any person or group when served interception order. So really, you know, the political solution may not even be wanted. We're spending literally billions of dollars on making our systems less secure these days. Now, given this, the question is, can we develop technologies and solve problems created by this kind of technology? Uh, first solution was deployed by the Chinese. They decided to hack back. Right? Um, not a great solution because it doesn't give you back civil liberty. It might give you back an edge uh, in terms of you know, economics, but in terms of civil liberties, you don't get them back that way. Uh, one other great solution that was proposed was moving data into European cloud. Right? Uh, well, the problem there is, first of all, you make yourself a very juicy target by having your data on some European center. So that is what the NSA is going to hack next then. And secondly, as we have seen, we may not want to trust the Europeans with this to begin with. So our answer uh, has been to effectively decentralize data and trust. So we don't store it on some central location. We force them to hack effectively every single PC, and that's hopefully something we can observe because the data is stored, our data is stored with us. And we do not trust some central entities or authorities with these things. When we try to decentralize everything, well, that really means we have to encrypt everything end to end. We have to decentralize our public key infrastructure as well. Decentralize how we store data, make sure we have no servers and no trusted authorities in the system. Now, it turns out that's really, really hard. But if we do that, we get no, make sure that there are no juicy targets for advanced persistent threats like the NSA. 
Now, what we do know is when we compare decentralized systems to centralized systems, well, the decentralized systems have a couple of disadvantages. They're typically slower. We don't have economics of scale. They're harder to use, harder to develop, harder to make secure, actually, harder to evolve. Uh, but compared to centralized systems, well, centralized systems we should think of as already compromised. Right? So it's you know, a bad choice, but uh, uh, certainly better than what we have right now. So the goal uh, of my research in Munich is essentially to make these de decentralized systems faster, more scalable, easier to develop and deploy, easier to evolve and extend, and of course secure. The overall vision is, if, you know, this is a little abstraction of how the internet works these days. You know, physical layer, ethernet, you've hopefully all seen that, IP and routing, TCP, UDP, DNS, the PKI, and then applications on top, is to build a new network. Uh, we start with effectively everything that the old network gives us in terms of connectivity. So if we can talk with H over HTTPS with somebody else, we use that. If we can talk with TCP, we use that. But then we start to, uh, the first step is encrypt every link. Right? So whenever there was a physical connection between two participants, we encrypt that uh, using uh, ephemeral Diffie-Hellman and AES. Above that, we add a secure routing infrastructure, the distributed hash table. Um, on top of that, we then do end-to-end -end encryption. So I encrypt on every link and end-to-end. -end. So the link encryption means that a passive attacker can't see even what's going on in the links. And end-to-end -end means even if I have a malicious node on the path, he can't see what the data is that's being exchanged between the participants. Then we replace the naming system and the public key infrastructure with a system we call the GNU Alternative Domain System, which I'm going to talk about next. And then we have to just worry about how to build new applications on top of the whole thing. And that's what we call the GNU Net system. OK. So the first just challenge we have is to figure out how we're going to decentralize naming. So this is a Zuku's triangle. I hope you can kind of see it. Uh, Zuku uh, put forward a hypothesis. He says it's impossible to have three properties in a naming system. He says it's impossible to have global names. So everybody who asks for what is the meaning of a name gets the same value globally. Have memorable names, as in the names are short and things that we can remember, like you know piratenpartei.de is something I can remember. If I have an 80-bit uh, uh, key uh, that's just random bit sequence, I can't remember that so easily. And secure, which is you know uh, that the mapping can't be tampered with by a third party, uh, but also they don't have to trust any centralized authority to do the right thing here. He said all three things at the same time are impossible to achieve. So, but of course we would like to have all three. If you take the current domain name system that you're using when you normally use internet today, uh, you're effectively using a system that is global and memorable. Right? So the names are globally mapping to the same kind of servers, and you can remember them easily. And uh, the DNSSEC system that is being deployed right now kind of uh, effectively tries to make that a bit more secure. Uh, so that's the arrow going up with certificates. Um, of course, it doesn't quite achieve security because in DNSSEC you're still relying on the root servers and the root certificate, which is owned and operated by well, mostly Americans. Now, uh, an alternative is a system that is global and secure. So here, uh, the main thing you might know is tors.onion namespace, where you have a hash of a public key followed by .onion. And if you look that up, well, it's hard to memorize that hash code, but it's a cryptographic binding, so it's, you're guaranteed to be talking to the right entity, and the names are global. There's uh, another system, secure and memorable, so it's perfectly secure and you can remember the names, but they're not global. If you are a Unix person, you know ETC hosts, where you can specify any name for any resource in your local computer, and that's valid for you. The mapping is now stored in your local computer, but other users can't use them, and they might have completely different mappings if they uh, write their own Etsy hosts file. So here we have a system uh, that is secure and memorable, but not global. There is an extension of that idea uh, called Satsi, uh, which is what our system is largely based on, which says, OK, I, I might have these private mappings that are secure, but I'm making them available to everybody else. So other users can refer to my names. So if I have a name for Jake and you have a name for me, you can do jake.me, whatever my name is for you, and access uh, Jake's uh, sites, for example. So 
uh, we have a secure and memorable system that achieves this transitivity property on top of it. And we can, of course, combine multiple of these systems, so it's not like we can uh, only have one uh, solution. So what we do is we have both cryptographic identifiers and this transitive namespace in one system, and that's what we call the GATS system. So in GATS we have signed resource records. We can have this secure delegation where I can delegate a subdomain to some other user uh, with cryptography, of course. Uh, and the resolution is decentralized using this uh, distributed hash table I mentioned before. And in the end, every user has to manage his own zone, and he doesn't have to trust anybody else to do resolution in that sense. So what does zone management look like? If you have ever done any DNS zone management, uh, this is a, you know exactly the same kind of thing where you say, okay, this is the name for the record, these are the values, this is the IP address of the server or whatever uh, uh, resource associated with the name, and you can just put that into your normal local machine the same way you would for, for DNS. Then uh, here's a simple example. Suppose Bob has a web server, so he would put into his zone www, www has an A record of 5678. Five, um, and here we put in a pseudonym that says he wants to be called Bob, and he signs this with his uh, public key. And once he's done this, he can in his own, in his own machine access his web server using www.gats. Right? And the point that there's .gats at the end effectively tells your machine, oh, I shouldn't use the DNS system, I should use the gats system. Then what he can do is he can print himself a little business card, uh, and he puts in his public key on, in this QR code, and he can give that to his friends. And then when his friends uh, uh, import this public key, they can then resolve Bob's records using whatever name they gave for Bob. So for example, Alice might import Bob's public key into her zone. Right, so this is now Alice's zone. She says, okay, Bob, and here's Bob's public key. And once she's done this, she can put it to her web browser, you know, www.bob.gats, and she will get to Bob's website. And how does this happen? Well, when her browser tries to resolve bob.gats, it'll first look in Alice's zone, find out, okay, that's Bob is in, has the following zone for Bob, and then she will go into the DHT and find out, okay, who has a record for www uh, in, in Bob's zone, what's that record? And she gets back the correct answer. Once we have that, we can also use this to replace the X509 PKI. Because in these zones, we can put records that say, okay, this is Bob's SSL server certificate, and then secure it this way because the certificates uh, provide us a trusted trust chain. So here's, for example, a, a website, uh, and this is an actual screenshot we did, where we put in a, 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 the website of the Internet Society in the GATS domain with the respective certificate, and the browser then was validating uh, uh, that the website was the correct website using the GATS system as opposed to using the X509 PKI. Okay, now this comes, uh, it's going to be a bit more technical now. <laughs> One of the things that you don't have in DNS is query privacy. So when you send a request out, everybody can see what you're asking for and they can learn everything about the response. So in our system, what you can do is you can send out a query and people will not learn what you were looking for. Right. Now, later, when you use it to establish a connection, they might still learn if you don't use uh, some kind of other service like Unit or Tor to hide what you're doing. Um, but already in this system, we try to maximize the privacy of your queries. Uh, and this is also for the peers that participate in routing your query and resolving it. They should not be able to know what you are looking up. So what we use for this is what's called elliptic curve cryptography. So in elliptic curve cryptography, you have the first thing is called elliptic curve. Uh, which consists of a couple of parameters. The most important ones are generator, G, that's a point in a two-dimensional space, and uh, uh, that po uh, point generates a group, and the group has a size, and that's called N, and N is a prime number. Okay. You don't need to really understand this part. <laughs> now, given these two parameters, which are just you know fixed, everybody knows them, you start by creating a private key, so this is your secret for your zone, which is just a number, um, mod n for the mathematicians, so just a big number, and that's what we call x. So anybody who has x is allowed to put records into the zone, and everybody who doesn't have x must not be able to put records to the zone. Okay, that's the secret that we each have. Then if I multiply x with g, 
I get another point. So x is just an integer, but I can multiply an integer with a point. I get another point, p. That's the public key. So if somebody wants to look up something in my zone, they have to somehow got my public key. That's what I put on this QR code. Okay? And the trick is, even if I know p and g, I cannot get calculate x. That's what's considered to be hard cryptographically. So next thing we have to have is a label for a record in the zone. So this is what the name I'm trying to look up, like www or Bob or Alice. Let's call that L. We represent it also as a number. And then when I do look up this name L in the zone for P, well, I get back a set of records, the answers, right? What's the IP address of the servers? What's the public key of uh, where I'm delegating to? Let's call those the records, that's RPL. And now I'm going to look for these things using a query that I'm going to send out to the network, that's QPL. And what I'm going to get back is BPL, which is the encrypted information that nobody else is supposed to learn about. Okay. So now here's how it then actually works technically. So when I have uh, my label L and my public key P, I first hash these two together, standard normal hash function. I get a little H number. Then I calculate D, which is the label number times my secret number mod n. So this d is in some sense a new private key that I've derived from x and l. And then what I do is I take my records, rpl, I encrypt them using a key that I've derived from, uh, from l and p, I sign them using the secret d, right, standard public key if I've got the private key I can sign with that, and I attach the public key which is d times g for the secret D. And I publish all of this under the query QPL, which is the hash of D times G. So the hash of this public key. Okay. Now if somebody wants to search for label L in zone P, he can also calculate the small h as hash of L and P. You know, these were the two parameters he had to know up front. Um, he can then calculate hash of L times P, so this is the point multiplication again, which happens to be the hash of L times G, time, L X G, which is the same as H D G. This is just standard multiplication. Um, so you can compute what the query should have been, use that to get from the network the encrypted response, and you can decrypt it using again the same function uh, that we used for encryption before. Now what is interesting here is that if I do not know in which zone, which P, you're looking for which label, I can neither say what your query was for, nor can I decrypt the answer. Right? I have to know both, exactly what name in which zone you're looking up, otherwise I will learn nothing from your query. So that's where we get query privacy in the system. Also, you can of course not put, Jake, you want to have a question? <laughs> <laughs> You of all people should understand the map. The question is, how can you make that assumption? Like, what if the label is with a certain set of bytes, and like, you know, it's like the same with the Well, yes, you can have a guessing attack. If I, you know, think, okay, I have Jake's public key for, for Jake's zone, right, and he might have a record www in there, then I can guess and do a confirmation attack. Right. right? So on my, on my next slide, you'll see confirmation attack is still possible. Yeah, well, the, that was what I was going to ask. And then the second part is... But you can, transport. for example, pick for your label a password. Or you can keep your public key for your zone you know, not super visible. You can make any number of zones as you want. And then you can get good privacy on those things. Is it possible to have transport security as well so that an observer, even a bad observer in there, can have end-to-end -end query privacy? And they'd have to break that first and then... Well, we, yes, we, we assume the attacker is already an active, active attacker in the GNUnet network. Right, who, who is sitting on the wire, He's, you're the first guy, you know, you're, you're sending this query out, and I'm the first peer right, that you're communicating with, and you know, the end-to-end -end encryption was between the two of us already, right, but I'm the attacker. Right? If, if you're outside, if you're a passive attacker on the normal internet, you won't, you know, you'll see there's a great conversation going on, you don't even know it's GATS. Right? But this is for the peers in the network, so even if the guy has cached the response, he can verify the signature, he can provide me with the answer, you know, he is the guy who, who has the data, and so he couldn't tell what he gave me. Is it possible that you could create a kind of alpha mixing like query system where 
you could basically set up a long-term session. I could connect to you through untrusted peers and resolve names that are individually encrypted to the session key that, that we have generated with some kind of Diffie-Hellman so that then even if there's an evil peer that can't do or begin to do guessing attacks at all without having first broken the session key, because if so, then you would have the same properties inside and outside of the network and then it would be impossible for them to do a confirmation without having also done an active man in the middle attack, which you stopped with the QR code in the beginning, for example. That's, does that make sense? Not quite. Let's talk about it later. OK, <laughs> sounds good. I mean, you, you can you know, get anonymity on top of all of this, right? OK. So what are the properties we have here now? It's a fully decentralized name system. We can have secure memorable names. We can have global unique secure identifiers. We can use things like QR codes for introduction. Uh, we can use delegation to make the names that we put in the system more useful for others. Uh, we get this query and response privacy, except against the confirmation attack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and this can be then used to create an alternative PKI. We can use it to validate TLS records, right? whatever. And so in Knut, we plan to use this for you know, file sharing applications, social networking applications, uh, there are people working on doing this for voice over GNUnet, where you need to identify who you're talking with. So all of these peer-to-peer -peer voice applications have this big problem that, okay, yeah, I can encrypt the session, but who do I know what the encryption key for the other party is? What's the public key infrastructure? And with this existing, you know, with Skype, you say, okay, I trust the Skype service. They know who the other guy is. He has been locked, locked in his username and password on Skype. And that's where your problems then come from. Here we don't need this. If you've got a chain of people that you know, okay, you know, Bob.dave.alice, and then you know via this chain I can authenticate the user. Okay. Questions on the GATS part, I should say. More questions. What about deniability? Where's the microphone? What about deniability was the question? Uh, deniability of what? Uh, so imagine that since I've given out my key to you and you verified it and you want to ask me about the label in the zone and I give you something, let's say, uh, another public key which I've generated just for you so we can conspire together to overthrow some but government. you give me a subzone, sub first of all, right? You would say, here's the subzone that I give you the key for. Yeah. So, and an attacker in the network records all that stuff. They've got, and they've got it all and they want to do some confirmation. So they go to your house and they beat you up and they take your keys. Does it resist, say, like in a week, in a month, the actual session information, will they be able to decrypt it? Will it be forward secret? And then the question is, if, if it is forward secret and they get you in the time window, do you have deniability in the sense that we talk about deniability and off the record messaging? Like, for example, either of us could have generated that uh, that data because we have a Mac okay. over okay. some First of all, in, in GATS, I, you don't have to be online for me to look up your records. Mm -hmm. So we can't have this, you know, uh, exactly the same thing that you would have in OTR messaging, where we both have a secret. Now what you do have on the GNUnet encryption side is all, all of the keys are ephemeral. Right? So, so the link encryption and the end-to-end -end encryption in GNUnet is all ephemeral keys, uh, and both sides could fake either side of the key. Uh, but that doesn't apply it to the GATS record system, because there your public key that you put in your zone would be you know, the thing you put on your QR code. Well, we assume that that's kind of a long-term key. But of course you can say, okay, I'm going to create a subzone. Right, that has some other private key, and I can't prove that it was yours. Right, that this subzone belonged to you. It could have de delegated to a com completely different per person, and I couldn't thereby then prove that uh, that was still you. So you could introduce ephemeral keys in that way, kind of, but not exactly in the OTR way. I mean, I, I imagine that since you're doing a key exchange with the person, you could do something at the same time to generate. Well, no, we don't do a key exchange with the person offering the records. Here. No, we're no, talking I mean, to the DHT. I mean, when you give a business card. That's, the, key, that's the, the new key exchange, right? And so then the, the question is, is it possible that we could do something that would allow us to have some deniability and some ephemeral keying while also being authenticated such that, uh, I call this the, after Zuko, he suggested this to me, the Zeta cartel problem, right? So the Zeta cartel comes to your house and they say, we're gonna kill your family if you don't do what we say. So you do what they say, because you don't want them to kill your family. This is different than the state covering you and the legal stuff that comes with that. So when the Zeta cartel comes and they force you to give it up, what do they get? And it sounds like from right now... Right now they would get control of your zone and they could do with your zone whatever they want and they would know because they found the private key of your zone on your drive 
That it's yours. That, that it's yours, unless you, of course, you should have encrypted your drive, but as they're going to kill your family, you might decrypt your drive for them or something. Exactly. Like so it, it would be interesting to try to add some deniability stuff by default to this, such that when the Zeta cartel comes and you comply, they get nothing. And hopefully they still don't kill your family. <laughs> Okay, I, I don't quite see how to do that yet, especially since the two parties are not assumed to be online at the same time. I want you to be able to use names that I have for other people while I'm offline. Um, so that makes it really hard. But when we do the key exchange with the business cards, an interesting thing we could do is if we literally had devices, it wasn't just a piece of paper, we might be able to generate shared secrets that we then put um, into our zones, or that we respond to that are unique. Well, you, you could always say that you have the label as a passport. If your label, which is the same kind of thing, is something that is not known, right? But the problem is if I confiscate your computer, I can see which records you might have on your system. I might be able to inspect the database. So what you'd have to do is you have to put something under that label into the DHT and then forget about it yourself. Yeah. And that, if you do that, then you know, I think fine. But well, I just don't see this as what most people would do in practice. Okay. I, I mean, I tend to agree, but I think if we make it do it that by default, for example, then that's what most people will do. So if we make sure that deniability is a part of it, then it will be what everyone does. I mean, that's how OTR has been as successful as it is, I think. And it's also what makes Tor very secure, is that we have board secrecy and we found a way to automate that stuff. Yeah. Nobody would ask for it. Um, but well, we did I just it. don't think that if you have your naming system and public key infrastructure labels be kind of one-time use things, that that's going to be terribly popular. Yeah, that's true. It might be hard to convince people of that. Okay. So uh, the next problem is that we, we, when we build decentralized systems is that they tend to evolve, or we would like them to evolve, but evolution is hard. So if I add an extension to my decentralized system, I can expect that you know, not all of the billions of users are going to upgrade in the same millisecond. Now if I'm you know, Facebook, I can deploy my new version of the software on the website and everybody who hits it with their web browsers can download the JavaScript code immediately and update at the time of my choosing. In a decentralized system based on free software, I can't force everybody to update. I mean, even Microsoft can't assume that every Windows user is going to upgrade, you know, like Snap, the same millisecond. And now I've got this decentralized systems where there are different versions of the software being deployed at the same time. So you've got clients who speak kind of new versions of the protocol, and peers that speak older versions of the protocol in the same network. That creates for some fun, right? So. The question is, how do we transition gracefully? And uh, how to do this gracefully, I have learned from Carlo. Uh, but let's start with what people have done before. Uh, so before, we have things like XML, which is a language that can support extensions. You've seen this with HTML, you know, one, two, three, four, five. I don't know how far they're gonna count. Uh, but the problem is, it's syntactically, I can make extensions, but the extensions are meaningless to older browsers. So HTML5 extensions will be meaningless to browsers that don't support HTML5. And what we would like to have is a system where extensions still have some meaning to older clients. So with uh, Psyche, we get that. So Psyche is a messaging protocol um, that uh, you know, has similar goals for messaging like what you might have seen with XML and JSON. Um, the main things of Psyche is, uh, are the peers exchange messages. A message consists of a state update and a method invocation. So state update, you can think of maybe you have a social profile and you change your profile picture or your contact list, or you have a, a messaging channel and you change the topic. The topic would be part of the state of the channel. And the method invocation is, you know, now I'm gonna do something uh, uh, like send a message to all my members, write something on my wall, whatever. And um, other ideas from Psyche that are relevant are things like uh, stateful multicast. So I'm multicasting these changes to all of the group members. So if I have a very large group, I don't have to be able to send it to each of you individually. I can have you cooperate in the distribution. I can look at the history. So I can look at what happened in the last five minutes. So when you log in, uh, you might like to see you know, the hist historic things that happened just before you joined. Um, and the updates to the state uh, are difference-based, so if the state becomes large, I can still do efficient updates by only sending the differences over the network. But as I said, the main thing of Psyche is that it, it addresses this extensibility problem. And we try to explain that. So when you look at the Psyche state, it's structured. So it's key-value pairs. 
Um, but the names for the values have some structure. So for example, we have here name, name first, name first Chinese. And so when I make extensions, I might make an extension of supporting Chinese first names. But older clients will still say, oh, I understand name first. I'll just ignore the Chinese part. Or they may not understand you know, first and last names, but then they would see, oh, it's still a name. And so it still has some semantics for those clients. The same thing was also done with the method invocation. So when I get a message which invokes a method, uh, it has this structure where it can be a message, can be a private message, a public message. And if I don't understand the very specific details, I'm going to the more, next more general class. So if you've done object-oriented programming, it's pretty much the same kind of idea, just in a message format here. And so this way, uh, if my application evolves, I can add more specializations. I can you know, add new types of mes uh, subtypes of messages, so to speak, or new substates, and older clients will understand them in their more general form. And they might not you know, apply the same kind of highlighting, the same kind of uh, very custom logic to them, but they might still apply some very gen generic logic that handles those message types. And here's a little bit of code for how this would be implemented. Effectively, I have my uh, handler array of all of the things that I can handle, all of the messages I understand. And when I get a method, I first see, okay, is the exact method that's being asked for, do I know that one? If not, I remove the part after the unders last underscore and try again. I try and slice. You try to match. If it doesn't match, you look for the next, next more generic mapping. Try again until you reach a top level handler. So the advantages of this is a very generic mechanism. It's extensive, can support many applications, so it's not tied to one particular application. Uh, the try and slice pattern can be applied to the state and the methods for looking up things. Um, and we now know what backwards compatible means here. If I introduce an extension where I just add a new underscore foo, right, then I know, okay, existing applications will interpret it without the specialization. If I introduce a new top-level method that has different semantics, I know now I'm breaking backwards compatibility for all clients. They will not be able to understand it at all. Now, there's a question. Uh, do you have a mechanism to uh, flag uh, certain sub-levels as uh, critical, like is done, for example, in, in X509 certificates? Uh, because otherwise, an older client might take a message public whisper, think it's a message public, and put it on the front page. No, it would, yeah, it would still treat it as a message public because it doesn't understand the whisper part, yeah. right? But you as a developer know, right, that that's how the semantics are going to evolve, right? You know that older clients that do not understand this new specialization will treat it as the respective parent. So I would prefer to define a message whisper or something in that exactly. case. Yes. You might, yes. So. When we talk about psych, so the good things are it's a very compact encoding. Uh, we have the stateful multicast for supporting large groups of users. We have the message history, which is important for many social networking applications. And we have this extensible syntax and semantics. And so we are going to use this to build a social networking foundation together with the GAT system for the PKI, uh, where we push social profiles, so the state to all the recipients. Uh, we don't use a federation. So you know all of these federated social networks like diaspora, where you effectively still have a server that serves thousands of users that you have to trust. So here, the social data for you lives on your machine, and the guys that you authorized as your friends, they will get the data that you authorized them for, and that will be stored on their machines and nowhere else. Uh, the main way you will access the network is by replaying information from a local database. So you won't go and have to, you know, oh, I'm going to visit uh, Carlos' profile, let me talk to his peer. No. When he made a change, my peer was authorized to see it. It will be pushed to me, replicated on my machine, and therefore be able, well, available to me instantly, in particular also if he's offline. The main thing, as I said, is my data stored on my machine only. And of course, my data includes all the data people gave me access to explicitly. Questions on the well, psych side? Carl. Do you have questions on psych? <laughs> no, I'm fine. I love, love your presentation. <laughs> yeah. What about the user experience? How do you get lots of people, like normal people, to use that thing? I mean, if I don't want my mother or my godmother to use it, how do I explain it? I got a microphone. Don't use your grandmother as the example. That's rude. <laughs> That's women, rude. Women know how to use computers, too. 
Let's use the grandpa. Are you trying with some mic? I can use my grandpa as well. You want to repeat your question? So my question was, what about the user experience of this software? Uh, if I want my uh, grandfather to use it, for example, uh, how can I explain him how to use this kind of thing? I mean, it's uh, because I think there is a value in opportunistic, opportunistic encryption in the, in the sense that everyone could, could encrypt their messages and not only people who have something to hide. But uh, all this, all those things look very really complicated for like the regular person to use. Well, you don't have to understand the math part as a user. But right. still, I mean, uh, you still have to install some obscure software on your computer to use that, uh, that software. Yes, now Carlo wants to answer that I'll question. Get that. <laughs> I'll get to that later. He wants to answer that question later. Okay, M my answer to you is, of course, we need to worry about usability and making this very easy to use, and we are way far, far away from that. Um, but I hope with uh, Jake's help, we will eventually be able to deploy routers to everybody where this is part of the standard set. Oh, sh I'm not, oh sorry, sorry. Not supposed to say that word. Uh, where well, this is effectively part of the default setup that you have, so that you wouldn't have to do the installation uh, all by yourself. I know too many things about you. Don't say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, again, a little bit technical thing, which is uh, if you want to do a search in a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, for example, for a peer that offers a particular service, one of the very powerful ways that uh, Unix people know how to do search is regular expressions. Who here has heard about regular expressions before? Oh, good. <laughs> uh, we'll see an example a bit later. Super. Okay. So, essentially, me as the person offering something, I can specify uh, a set of strings that would correspond to what I'm offering as a regular expression. So when I'm a peer offering it, I build a regular expression that describes my service. And if there's a, what we call patron looking for peers offering a particular service, they have a search string right, that they will use to search those peers. And so uh, the question now is, how, how does the patron find the peer that, or the peers that offer a matching service? And so what we do is we start with uh, taking the regular expression, oops, sorry, compiling it to what's called a deterministic finite automaton, store that one in the DHT, and then the patron can search it. Now, let me give you a little example. <laughs> so here's a, a regular expression. It says A, B, or C, D. So any string that starts with either A, B, or C, D, then has, oops, has an E, or one, zero or more E, so it's E star means E, 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 whatever, and then one F. So any of those strings matches this particular regular expression. So when we take this regular expression, so we can convert this into a deterministic finite automaton. It sounds very complicated, but it's easy. Uh, you start at Q0, and that's the starting state. And then you take your string that you're trying to match, and you see, OK, it's labeled the two edges A and C. So if it starts with A, you go to the state A. If it starts with C, you go to the state C. If it doesn't start with either, well, we say we will not, we'll not find it. It doesn't match. Then if it follows with a B or a D, you go into this big state in the middle. If it then has an E, well, you keep where you are. And if it then has an F, you go to this last state, which has this double ring, which says, OK, you're there. And that's where kind of the peer would be that is offering the service. OK, then we have an algorithm how we can map the states from this DFA into the DHT. And then if peers look for a string, they will effectively follow the chain of transitions in the DHT to the peers that offer the respective service. And we can show that. Uh, even if millions of peers do these offerings and searches, the data will be consistent. You will find exactly the peers that offered matching services and not anybody else. And that's a bit uh, technically on the complicated side to prove that that works. I'll skip over the details, right? So we implemented that and uh, uh, tried it on some interesting data set where peers were effectively saying, okay, uh, but suppose I'm a Tor exit node and I'm offering exit services for these IP address ranges. Uh, that's my service description. And then I'm looking for an exit that supports a particular IP address uh, as the search term. And uh, here's a little graph on how fast we can do the search uh, with a peer-to-peer -peer network with 100 milliseconds latency between the peers and how many uh, queries were successful after, I think in the end, 30 seconds, pretty much all of them were done. So this is a little bit of technically how we can do searches in peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, the latency it depends on the length of the string. 
And so based on the you know, 30 seconds latency, you can see it's only suitable for applications that, that allow moderate latency. Yeah, so we plan to use this for network searches, discovery of services, and for things like topic-based subscriptions and messaging applications. So, after these technical things, uh, let me conclude. I think everybody has something to hide, and decentralization that is needed to make that happen creates plenty of challenges for research. I should stress that unlike Tor, uh, our project is not yet a dissident-ready product. Uh, do not try to do this at home unless you've compiled your own kernel. Uh, like Tor, uh, we are free software, and help is welcome and needed. And uh, finally, we say we must decentralize or really risk to lose control of our lives. And uh, as economic and ecological pressures get bigger, the repression apparatus that is being built these days will be used against us, and now is a good chance to fix that. Thank you. More questions? Where's the microphone? It's coming. Hi. Um, just a, a short question um, about all the encryption going on on top of um, HTTP. So uh, if I'm doing something like voice over whatever that is, uh, is it actually possible uh, with all the CPU that has to be used in order to encrypt and decrypt and so on? It turns out the CPU usage is really not a problem for voice applications. So that is so cheap these days, especially since what you have to do is all of the voice packets is really just symmetric cryptography. That is really, really, you know, less than a millisecond, you don't care. What you might care about is that you might have to go over multiple hops in the network to get to the target. So with the IP network, you might have a somewhat shorter path, and the latency on the IP network or even the overlay network is what you have to watch out for. Now, how well that works out depends, of course, a lot of who you're talking with. So if you're talking about 50 hops, you know, going to the US, to, then back to Great Britain, and then to Australia, yeah, it's going to be a problem. Uh, if you're talking within your community, where you have a nice little wireless mesh network, and you're two hops away, you know, it might be great. And better than what you get these days with your ISP. So it depends a lot on the network topology, but the thing to worry about is not the cryptography, but the link latency and the number of links you have to traverse. And that's one of the things we can always, of course, opt try to optimize and try to do better at routing. Uh, again, one of these technical issues uh, that, that here was kind of lost all the way saying, you know, we use a DHT. But that's kind of where the magic would have to be for getting the latency down. It's not the crypto. OK. Um, it seems to me that with the NSA collecting all of the data that they do, even if you use encryption, they can still tell that you have used encryption. So it seems to me that all they really need to do is just convince all the governments in the world to outlaw encryption wholesale. Well, and the French have done that already uh, with limited success. As far as I know, crypto, at least strong crypto, is illegal in France. I don't think the French would like that or follow that rule so much. They stopped that rule in 1996. They, they, they stopped that rule already? OK. Yes. But, uh, but still. again, you start outlawing crypto, you know, a lot of things will break these days. And uh, online banking. Well, and the French, hmm? and the French have. Yeah, then only outlaws will have crypto, is what Jake says. Uh, as I said, I don't think that's a very serious threat that I would have to worry about right now. And the French, and, and, and an interesting observation is that the French have turned uh, uh, increasingly to cryptography uh, um, once they had the free strike rule that. Uh, once you uh, were found uh, guilty of uh, some misdemeanors uh, for the third time, you, you uh, lost your internet access. Yeah, but I think really what we need to get is uh, get everybody to use crypto in the first place and not worry about crypto being illegal. And everybody using crypto doesn't help us much if the government has the keys, so we need to decentralize PKI. More questions? Just a quick comment then. Um, what we saw recently in Australia was that they uh, uh, moved to make it illegal to not hand over the keys. So that if you you were caught using, uh, caught, caught, being, caught being suspicious somehow, because you don't need yeah. to try very hard to do that, 
That's, it then becomes an offence if you do not hand over the keys. And we, yeah, we that, that's the that. Zeta cartel uh, uh, attack. Effectively, you're being compelled to hand over the keys and you really have no choice but to do so. Um, and that's why on the link encryption and the end-to-end -end encryption, we use ephemeral keys. So in our case, after 12 hours, you don't have the keys anymore. But that's so you can't defense. hand over the past uh, <laughs> keys. But, but that's not, not a defense, apparently. I tried to argue that, and I will continue to argue that. Well, on the technical side, it's the best we can do. It's because we make it impossible for you to comply. And, you know, of course, you can say, well, what if the judge doesn't understand? <laughs> uh, but that's not something I can fix other than by trying to educate the judge. Uh, Jake wants to say something. So a few years ago, we designed a system called uh, Mutually Assured Information Destruction. And it was a... Uh, um, it was basically a system where you could, it was the opposite of the rubber hose file system, right? Where the rubber hose file system, someone would torture you forever and you could give them some number of uh, passwords and eventually they would give up on torturing you. That was the theory. And Julian uh, Assange and Ralph Philip Weinman designed this protocol um, and they put it into a hard drive encryption program and they shipped it. And MAID was the response to that, which is you want to give an oppressive government one password and prove that you have given them the correct password, but you don't want the data that would be decrypted by that um, to uh, be useful to them, right? So you tell them the password is, fuck the police coming straight from the underground, they type it in, and then it says, yes, that's the right password, you've complied with the law. But then they can't do anything with it. Um, using GNU-Net and a DHT and systems like that, we could build MADE in an afternoon, and then you could comply with that law, but it, you wouldn't actually be able to decrypt the drive. So, so constructions like that become really simple and very easy to build with what Christian is talking about doing. Um, and I was told by a lawyer it will work exactly once, and so maybe that's you. <laughs> what do you mean it will work exactly once? As in, uh, as soon as you do something cute with the legal system, Judges tend to, especially when legislators work with them, um, to change the law to make sure that when you think you are cute, you are actually just in prison. And um, they would make it so that you can't use systems where you can't comply in this way, and they would interpret it that way. This was the thought that the lawyer said. They'll just make using that kind of system itself illegal. Exactly. So you can do a cute technical hack, but if it subverts the, the general desire of the legislation or of the judges, then they would go after you for that. And uh, obstruction of justice is a generic charge they could throw at you for doing that. So it's very important that we actually re retain the right to remain silent, and especially against self-incriminating uh, pieces of evidence, like passwords and keys. But also having ephemeral keys means that you don't have data to give up when possible. And, and there's also very good technical reasons, aside from privacy, for ephemeral keys, because you can't be compromised two years from now and all of the data you have in the past is lost. And so it's much less likely that you know the use of ephemeral keys would be outlawed. At least I seriously hope that. Okay, Carlo. All right. So your turn to carry the microphone. All right. Thanks, Christian. Oh, that was great. Christian explained the stuff that I used to explain in my talk. So I, now I can talk about other stuff. Um, <clears throat> like uh, oh, we're the secure share project. We're coming from the psych world, and uh, um, we chose GNUnet. Uh, we used to do federation, and uh, oh, we explained it. He, Christian explained it before. It's uh, with federation, you're essentially putting a lot of things on several servers. The idea was. The, the original internet was an, a nice idea, everyone has his mail server, everyone has his mail, web server, why are we putting all the stuff in with big companies if we can have our, our own servers? And, and in practice uh, that doesn't work very well because we're actually um, distributing even more trust to even more servers and then there's always the people that have no way, why should they choose a server? Why They get to the point that they're asked, now choose a server. And by which means should they choose a server to trust? And so they might be using some popular uh, trusted server like the Chaos Computer Club or the Pirate Bay or uh, something. Uh, but most of them will end up just taking the commercial offering from Google or from Microsoft. So even if you have a safe machine at home that doesn't help if the others are using Google. 
so um, and, and it gets worse because uh, nowadays you can have a server for eight euros a month. It's really cheap. Just go and get a server for eight euros a month. And um, well, something that I'm I've been waiting like in the past weeks. Uh, I got rid of all my paranoias because they all suddenly turned real. And uh, now I know, okay, it's that bad. Uh, for some reason it shocked me anyway, I don't know why. And uh, this is a little paranoia that hasn't been proven yet officially, but I bet it's only a question of time until we'll hear of this. This means you can get a server for yourself for eight euros a month. It's so cheap because it's a virtual machine. So it runs on a, a big server run by a company, might even be a German company, but it's just a simulation running on this server. And there are many ways, to, like you can install your own mail on it, your, your, uh, your uh, Jabber server, you can install all the software that you like to do on it. And uh, the, the, you will not even find out that you're being controlled because you, it, the, the outer machine can give you bad random numbers. Like the random numbers aren't actually really straight random. That means that the cryptography sucks and your cryptography can be hacked. Or otherwise it, the, the memory can be directly accessed of your virtual machine. So, um, and then, and then, Attacker can just, uh, that there, there has been released a paper that knows how to find a private key in memory automatically. So the private key can be extracted while you're just installing your software or your, your web server. You're installing a certificate for your web server. Well, the NSA already has the private key to your certificate so they can read all the traffic that is going to go through the server. Um, yeah, the controlling system can be accessible to these observers by means of the fantastic PRISM program. Um, so um, it is possible to have entire networks of people operating federated uh, social infrastructure or federated whatever, email, whatever, the whole network can be monitored. So that's not a good idea to actually think in terms of servers these days. It's just not, it doesn't work out. So we need end-to-end -end encryption, we need forward secrecy, okay, we got some software that actually already does that. and. Uh, we also like the GADs and we like the multicast, so that brought us to, all right, we need something like GNUnet. That's why we're working together with Christian and GNUnet. So what the hell, why multicast? Well, uh, Psyche used to be a chat and messaging tool, and we always thought that sending one message to several recipients is, is essential, and uh, some other chat systems do not solve this properly, but we thought that's, that's actually one of the main challenges. And when it comes to social, uh, social uh, activity, like the stuff you do on Facebook, each little thing you do is a message that goes out to several people. Like you send an update and it's to a lot of people. You send, you upload pictures and it's for all of your friends. And you, you distribute an article that you have just read. Or you modify uh, data, your phone number in your profile. Well, we want this stuff to be on your device, on your computer, as soon as possible. Like if you're going out of, away from the internet with your phone, it already has the new phone number of your friend because it downloaded it earlier. You don't have to be on the internet to look up the profile. It's not like Facebook, you have to be online to reach, to get to the stuff. It's already on your computer. So we're distributing all the data all the time and we need a good strategy for distributing. And the most obvious way to do it would be, okay, let's connect every other node and, and send a copy of our stuff. That's what uh, several, a lot of communication systems do. Just connect each and distribute the things. It gets terribly slow when you have a large number of people. You couldn't possibly do, let's say, a Twitter profile with it. Like if you have a Twitter with thousand people, you can't do it like this. Uh, the solution that the uh, commercial world has done is they have a cloud. So what is the cloud? Well, you just connect to some endpoint and then the cloud magically does it and you don't know exactly what it does. Well, what it actually does, it, most clouds actually inside, they do some multicast and maybe we should do some multicast ourselves too. Multicast is actually very, very simple. It just means there are some nodes that will help me distribute the thing to other people. Whoa. Big deal, big surprise, why haven't they thought about it before? 
Well, it's actually a decades-long uh, old idea, but it hasn't been implemented too many times. Uh, there are some good examples, like BitTorrent works that way. That's why it works. <laughs> and uh, there's some peer-to-peer -peer television stuff that works that way. So uh, you can do big stuff with multicast. You can even distribute a, t a, a TV stream to a lot of people. So all you have to do is do it. And for some reasons, a lot of technologies do not do so. Uh, like email. Email doesn't multicast. That's why if you're sending a message to uh, thousands of people, it will keep the server busy for a while. Uh, and uh, all the third is social web stuff like Jasper and Frenica, etc. So uh, you have a scalability problem. If that stu stuff becomes popular, it stops working. So that's not useful. And, and it's always too late. Like when it gets popular, you want it to keep working because you, otherwise you lose the people again. Another point is the multicast is something that works with several people, several nodes on the way, several hops on the way. It's very similar to what the onion routing does, like Tor, like GNUnet. It has a lot of nodes and it sends packets over several nodes. So it is a very similar way of, of operating the network, only that with multicast it's even more useful because it is meant for more people. So we can mix that these two strategies. We can have multi we can have things distributed just because they need to go somewhere really quick, and it doesn't matter if it's it doesn't have to be very obscure, and some other things which are supposed to be very private. So we have them hop over several hops, and to an observer, it all looks the same. You can't distinguish if it's just being social chatter going on, or if somebody's telling something really secret to somebody else. So it provides social activity, provides for a lot of nice cover traffic. Um, another interesting aspect is that with the social graph, we get a new uh, dimension to uh, the onion rooting strategies, because we get to have an idea of how much uh, one node is friends with other nodes. like. Some people are friends on the first level, some are like second level friends. And uh, if, if there's a node that you have no relationship to at all, well, you just might decide not to use it, not to include it in your communication. And uh, this creates a, a possibility for you to uh, have a, a server help you. So, hey, we get back to using those eight euro virtual machines again. We take those eight euro, eight euro virtual machines, and they just have the job of sending packets around because they're really good at that. If you take a server, it's, it has good speed, it's real reliability, it can store things while uh, the, the actual users are, are offline. So that's kind of useful. And uh, it has a role, you can trust it because it's my server, because there's a social graph relationship to it. So we can speed up the way uh, peer-to-peer -peer stuff works, if we want to. <clears throat> um, so they broke the internet, and we'll make ourselves a new one, and I'll skip all the stuff that's on this list, because I'll show some pictures instead. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, the first step what we can do with a technology like that is, well, we can do some messaging, we can do some file exchange, so we don't need those companies anymore to do it. Um, um, next on, we can do some social updates and we can share some media, so we don't need all of these companies anymore. And uh, maybe later we can do some applications on top of, of the social infrastructure that we have. That is pretty much what these companies are doing. They just have something extra put on the social layer. And, uh, well, um, we can come to the point that we do more collaborative work on office documents, for example, or we can do location-based services. Uh, we can have a financial system on top of uh, these things. Or we can do teleconferencing. So, well, we are reinventing the internet if we want to. And, uh, and we'll make ourselves a new internet. So uh, what's with the business? Are we kicking all those folks out of business? Oh, well, um, I couldn't figure out a business model. 
I was in the new economy 10 years ago. I couldn't figure out a business model that would make sense for maintaining freedom and privacy. As soon as you keep the software to yourself, that's a business model, but then it doesn't help freedom. But we can still allow commerce to, go, to happen on top of our free software. So if we build this for the platform, we can still have plenty of commercial content because you chose to subscribe to the, to the company that builds fantastic bicycles. And so they send you the, uh, the update with the new bicycle they built. But it's your choice, it's not spam. You chose to receive it. So the content can be commercial, but the code has to be free because basic civil rights have to prevail. So we want free software and we want free hardware. We want free devices that we know that's not, nothing wrong with them. We want a computer that really we know what is, it is running. We put free software operating system on it. We put free software communication systems on it. And we want to be, have certification systems that ensure that this damn computer is free. And we want to get into politics so we can make laws that say you have to run a free computer in public administration. We want you to run a free computer in your lawyer office as a journalist. We want you as a doctor to run a free computer so it doesn't mess with the laboratory results of your clients. What we need is the political vision and the political will to do this. Thank you. I have a question and it is, um, well first you were talking like how evil servers are and how they can access the VM in memory and get the private key and everything and then later you were reintroducing servers as yeah we need them for social messaging and they can relay messages back and forth and I didn't get that part, can you explain that again? Alright, I have to be more clear, uh, the, thanks to the amazing software packages like Nunet or Tor, these uh, these nodes in between, they just do the job of shuffling, of sh sending things around without really understanding what they are doing. And if we apply a social graph logic, then they might know they are doing it for somebody who's vaguely in your social network, but they still don't know what they are doing and for whom they are doing it. And that's the, the, the essence, and that's totally different from how we are using servers today. Today, servers know everything about us, and we are totally relying on them with all of our, our private crap. And so it, it might, it would be useful, or it might be even better if we don't need them, but I don't know how, how well, we'll, how quickly we'll get there. If we want to have a, a faster network, it can be a solution. And the, the essence is they don't know what they're doing. I would like to know how do you want to finance free hardware and software? I want more political finance. <laughs> Go ahead, Christian. You have an answer to finance? No? He has an answer to finance. I was so oh. sure he would. <laughs> well, he hasn't given me much money yet. Just stress. So, um, I think, uh, hi. So, I think that there are some interesting financial models, and I think that for free hardware, part of the problem is, well, what do you, what do we mean by free hardware? I mean, the free software world traditionally has had a really simple way of dealing with this, which is that every piece of object code you have, you have corresponding source code that allows you to create that object code, right? So that's really simple, but what is a resistor? Is that, you know, is that the equivalent of object code? Um, is it only the PCB when it's laid out? And there's this guy over here, the kernel, who is like the most, he's like the RMS of the hardware world. I mean that, you know, really, I don't, anyway, I'm not going to dig up in this, I'm just going to move on. but. Um, I think that if we look at the cost of the hardware, the initial cost that is the really big problem is the cost of actually having someone build the hardware, test the hardware, and then make sure that the software, the free software that we want to run, actually runs on it. And so I'm working on a project um, that is a free hardware project, actually, 
uh, to try to take back the edge of the house. So you have a thing in your house as well as um, some other computing devices. And the idea is to have free hardware where it's as open as is possible, as free as is possible in terms of op open documentation. And once it's actually finished, um, that is once the initial investment has been completed and it has been paid for, then we have this thing. And all we have to do is fab it. And if you're able to put enough money together in a crowdfunding way, we can drive down the total cost of actually producing this because we can buy the parts um, basically in bulk. And the more we buy, the cheaper it gets. Because you do get economies of scale in this case. Um, so it's difficult though. Like uh, Sebastian's project, the Milky Mist, is a video mixer. And I found out yesterday, much or two days ago to my surprise, that he had only made 100 of them. So it's very sad when two people that aren't him were sitting at the table and had purchased this. Because we thought it was tens of thousands. And um, he, should, he should have been making tens of thousands of them. But it's really hard to bootstrap that initial, initial process. But he did all the really hard work. And then at the very end, now we cannot buy them as easily. And that, that's kind of a shame. So if we solve the first part of the problem, and I think some of that is with research money, then the actual manufacturing part can be really simple and very quick and very affordable where every person can put in just a small amount of money, and then they get something which they could never, ever have by themselves in isolation. Um, and for the hardware project that we're working on, a few people, you should be involved in it too. Um, if you're interested in this, you should come and talk with me. I'm not really, I don't want to hype it or to announce it in public right now because of some complexity. Um, but I really think that this is a, a pretty straightforward economy of scale, and it's a pretty straightforward project that has really good returns. And then. Hopefully, we can move it to being completely free, like no proprietary CPUs, for example, which is something that Sebastian has been working on with uh, the Milky Mist, and it's really impressive. But that means that there's a different cost we have to pay, and this is one which is not about fabbing the hardware. It's about actually being willing to put up with something that is running on an FPGA, which is an order of magnitude or two slower than an ASIC, or a traditional CPU, which may have a backdoor in it. So there's some trade-offs that have to be made that are interesting, and it really depends on what you're willing to pay. If it's not money that is the issue, but it's your time, for example, maybe you will be very unhappy with the FPGA. So it's, it'll be great, though, when that's the problem we have, as opposed to maybe backdoor hardware, or certainly backdoor hardware, or proprietary software. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, there's a question over there. Uh, just a quick note, um, at the beginning you, of your talk you outlined a threat model um, for virtual servers that you don't know if they're, co if they're compromised uh, when you rent them for 8 euros. And uh, there were, just was a paper published a few days ago uh, about uh, doing a side channel attack on GNU PG from a second virtual server in this, on the same machine. Uh, so with uh, this kind of research happening now, I think it's, it's safe to assume that uh, all virtual servers are pretty much compromised. Even if not intentionally by the NSA. Okay, Jake? So hi, um, I don't have any slides and I won't take hopefully too much time, but I just wanted to sort of echo the things that have already been said and probably what, what um, RMS is going to talk about. And I think what we need is a big picture vision of what people actually want to do with their computers. Because I think that part of the thing that has failed is that um, a lot of people who are working on technological solutions are trying to solve very specific problems and they solve them in a sort of uh, either in an ivory tower in the case of academia, no offense uh, intended there, or in you know a very personal way for free software people. They have a specific thing they want to do and they do it. And very rarely is this cohesive, and very rarely do those things go well together, and sometimes they don't, um, they don't compose in a way that, that works well. Um, so if we think about the big picture, what, what Christian is talking about is a part of the big picture, but we need to think about it like, how would you build a dating site on a system like that? How would we make it so that it's integrated into daily life? How would we make it so that it became a part of the social functions that we actually have? 
so that we would use it naturally? How can we share music on it in, in, in a way? How can we actually use data centers in a way where we can get one property, let's say availability of that data, and we can prove that it's available? But then we can also decentralize it so that if it goes down, we don't actually lose access to our data. Um, I think to do this, we need free and open hardware, openly specified, freely available, free as in free software, free as in free hardware. We also need a free software operating system. So this is what the GNU project and the Free Software Foundation have been working on for longer than I've been alive. Um, these things are absolutely critical to do that. And one of the, the sort of key things to tie together all of this is, for example, cryptography. But another thing is about verifiability. So when you build software right now, if you compile, let's say, the Tor browser today, we have a new version of the Tor browser, which we're soon going to release, and it is a beta that you can test. If you compile it on your computer, or Richard compiles it on his computer, the actual resulting binary is identical. And this is because we want to make sure that if someone downloads a binary of the Tor browser from us, that they will actually have the same one that they would build from source. And then many people around the world can sign the hash um, of the actual thing that we think we are releasing, and then there's no reason to just trust us. You can build it from source and make sure it's identical. And then you don't have to have, um, for example, the uh, ability to do uh, disassembly or decompile uh, any parts of the object code. And then if you have all the source code, you can see what actually is the result. So that kind of verifiability, we need that also for hardware. We need a way to openly look to openly specify and freely specify a board, sort of like the stuff that Sebastian has been doing, and then to be able to take a random board, x-ray the board, and make sure that it matches. And we need software to do that, so that we can actually look at the board and see that it does what we think it does. And then we need to be able to take the source code and do the equivalent of that, so that we can actually verify it. And that will be very hard to accomplish for entire operating systems. Um, but when we have these kinds of systems, it really, I think, gives us some great opportunities. And I think it's, I mean, it allows us to say, hey, is there a backdoor in the CPU? Well, we can inspect the source code for the entire CPU because it's written in VHDL or something like this, and then it's loaded into an FPGA, and we know this FPGA has certain features, and we can identify them with an x-ray to see that, in fact, those features are there. And you can pay someone to reverse engineer a particular board to shave it down to make sure that it does have what we think it does. So if we, if we apply that, all through and through, it means that these things become more accessible, or at least they become verifiable. And at least we have some way to sort of trace through the entire picture. And then with cryptography, we can link up with other systems like this, and we can have applications on top that people actually care about. And so then it's not a, a, a house of cards, let's say. Because at, at the moment, we have a lot of free software, and it sits on top of uh, non-free hardware. And if I was a betting man, um, and I am often, um, you know, I would say that that's a problem. I wouldn't exactly say why, but I guess there's plenty of stuff that shows that it is a problem, but I would say that it's a problem. I think that Sebastian has convinced me of this. That's pretty much my main reason for believing that, in case there was any question about that. But looking at, at, at for example, Intel CPUs with the microcode updates, those appear to be signed with a 2048-bit RSA key. Well, if Intel is an American company, and Intel has the ability to push out microcode updates to the CPU, and they sign them. And you actually fetch them over HTTP, I might add, without any encryption. Um, what does that tell you? It means you, even if you shave the chip down, um, it would be possible for them to just load in some microcode to change the way your CPU works, and when your machine powers off, it goes away. So we need to, we need to be able to understand the edges of those things. And in, right now, I think we actually just can't do that very well at all. And that's a really big problem. And I mean, there's literally one person in the world, maybe two people in the world, that are really working on this in, open, uh, in, in the open. One of them is Bunny, who created the Chumbi and is working on an open laptop. That open laptop, I think, is a key project. Because when we have an actual open and free laptop, we can use that to build other things. So for example, he's also on his blog, he documented that he's working on a router. So that's a really fantastic thing, because it means that with those two devices, we move closer towards having the free hardware and free software reality, where we don't have to trust a corporation to give us some binary blob and to keep us secure, or to hold a key, and then that key, of course, who knows who else has it. Right? If I were guessing how the business records uh, provisions 
um, for the NSA works, I would guess that they can probably ask companies for things that they consider to be uh, relevant business records. And if they think your data is a relevant business record, I suspect that things that impact the integrity of your data will be the same. So I think the big, big picture is that we need to think 30, 40, 50 years out into the future. The way that, the, the way that Richard Stallman thought about free software, I suppose, in the beginning, I wasn't there, I wasn't even born, but uh, to think in the big picture, not about freedom as in very small scope freedom, but freedom as in the big freedom, the freedom, liberty, to be at liberty. And, and that's really the core, I mean, in my, in my opinion, the core of why free software is such a radical idea for a lot of people is that it's not just about software. It's about the ends that the software bring into the world and about what people end up being when they have free software versus when they have proprietary software. And so the same is true, I think, for hardware. And I think when we have these things, we have the, the sort of grounding, the underpinning for a much freer society or free societies over the entire planet. And we're never going to get off this planet and, ex and explore space if we don't solve a lot of these problems at home, I think. And uh, I want to die on Mars, but not when we land, I think, is the, is the phrase. Um, so I'm hoping we can really have free systems like this, and we can really normalize understanding them and fab them, but also to study them and to change them in the case of software. And in the case of systems that are built on FPGAs, we may be able to dynamically change the hardware by having software. So the thing we need to fab is a very simple thing, and the ability to change that thing becomes a matter of changing software. So a software-defined radio, for example, that uses an FPGA is a really, really incredible and powerful tool. So we can have a use for it today, and in 10 years you can literally change it to do something else that the original designer didn't think of. So it really gives us the ability to hack the planet, sorry for the pun, but really it allows us to do stuff that we can't really do right now. Um, coincidentally, the router that Bunny is building has a Spartan 6 FPGA inside of it. So it's clear that other people have this, this line of thinking, and I think that's really brilliant. And I wanted to just sort of encourage that and to see the big picture of tying it together. And I think that we can self-fund almost all of this. We don't need the state. We usually don't need the state. I know that most Europeans love the state, and I like your state too right now. But, um, <laughs> you know, an, an, an individual's alliance with the state is a temporary one. Right, and the state decides when they want to end it, and you usually don't have much of a choice. I say that as someone who is currently applying for a visa in Germany. So, um, you know, sometimes states don't do the right thing. So it would be great if we can find a way to economically finance this in a way where the state's power is removed from the equation, for the most part, in terms of sustainability. But maybe in the beginning, some of the funding comes from the state, because right now the state is, in fact, friendly. So the fact that Christian Grutoff doesn't have $2 billion in research grants is understandable, because it's hard to understand these big concepts. And yet at the same time, when the economic espionage cost is in the billions of euros, one has to wonder why we're not investing in thinking of these solutions um, and really actually trying to understand these spaces. Because a lot of these things are really hard to comprehend, but also to solve. So we really need to be working on that. So if you have any interest in these things at all, even just a passing one, you should really come and talk with Christian or myself or other people that are working on these things. because. Of, I think this is a, a good 40-year re research problem, and if you only put five minutes into it, it's very appreciated. Um, and, and the end result, I think, is that we can really have a much freer planet, and individually we will be more free, which is, I think, worth doing. And I think the outcome of not doing this is, pretty, is, is likely to be quite tragic. And you can see this, for example, with people that are stuck with Apple-related uh, hardware and software because you'll see that they want to change certain things and they are unable to do that, or they want to reprogram and repurpose their devices with free software. For example, the Tails uh, bootable live CD, which helps to Torify all the things you do on your computer, boots into Debian. It'll probably work on this laptop in front of me, but Apple has changed their newer hardware so that it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. It wasn't because of Tails that they made this change, but it's very, very difficult to make Tails work on this. And now we'll have to do substantial engineering changes to Tails to make that work. Well, if the core of the system was core boot, instead of this garbage EFI stuff that has been forced down our throats, um, that maybe would be a different outcome. Uh, maybe it would be exactly the same, but I think it would be different. And, and so we really need to look at, at, at replacing these kinds of things and also think about it as being not actually so sexy. I mean, they have great design. But it is the aesthetic of slavery, in a sense, where you are not free. You are only free to do what Apple says. 
And it isn't just Apple, it's Microsoft, it's Google, it's other places. And a lot of people are locking these things down. And so we need to work on building alternatives. And I think the best way to do that is to actually figure out what we want to do when we have any system at all. And then we will actually be able to start to build those alternatives that will respect our freedoms with free software and with free and open hardware. And hopefully we can freely communicate and freely read when we have anonymity systems and we distribute and decentralize in a secure way. So that was a whole lot. I had a mate, thank you. So, um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to say if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. I also want to make a comment about X key score if any of you are interested in that. Okay, so what we learned about X key score, who here did not hear about X key score? Raise your hand if that doesn't mean anything to you. Please, one person, thank God. All right, so uh, X key score wa was very uh, seriously hinted at in a bunch of documents, and then yesterday or the day before that, The Guardian released a whole bunch of slides about X key score. And my read on those documents, which should just terrify everyone, but not to a point of inaction, but should still be scary is that these guys basically built a distributed TCP dump for the entire planet. They have a ring buffer where they store multiple days worth of all of the internet's traffic in this ring buffer. This sounds a lot like the Tempora system um, the GCHQ is running for the United Kingdom. And then they're able to search inside of the ring buffer through a distributed sort of graph. Like, as I mentioned to Christian, it's sort of like Google for uh, a surveillance system where they have these queries that uh, basically have a hierarchy and then they flow downward. So one person types a query here and it flows out to hundreds of nodes around the world and then it looks into that data. Well, so attacks only get better and those slides were five years old. So if, if the slides were from 2008 and those are three days of buffer, I'm guessing in five years they've got more than three days. So that is really terrifying stuff. And uh, it's particularly terrifying because the way that they do these queries suggests that they look for what we would call a protocol distinguisher on the wire. So they look for information, and if you can search for it, that is, if it's indistinguishable from noise, they're going to have a hard time searching for it. But if it's distinguishable from noise, like it's an identifier, like your email address, then they can put that into the search, and then it will pull data out of that, and then feed some of that return data back. Presumably they have automated queries that do this all the time from the rest of what the slide says and presumably that means that it's a kind of data retention based on these selectors. So the more that we turn signal to noise, that is the more that the internet is totally encrypted, the less we care about systems like that existing, regardless of whatever political situations we come up with. So I think it's really important to do that and it's also very important that we have ephemeral keys not long-term keys, because what they also talk about in these, these slides is a group called TAO, or Tailored Access and Operations. So Tailored Access and Operations is the black hat arm, I mean, I guess if you want to insult quality black hats, but they're the black hat arm of the NSA that breaks into people's computers. And we could just call them green hats, actually, <laughs> or whatever a green hat is that loves the state, that's some sniveling version of a green hat. And so the thing is that that is totally, absolutely terrifying. Because they're able to do uh, a query to the database, and they say this in the slide, give me all the vulnerable computers from country X. Well, then they break into those computers. So it's an active attack. So that means that anonymity, literal anonymity in the set of data they have, allows you to have a kind of herd immunity, if you will. But they also flip it on its head, and they say, look for things that are encrypted. So that's because encryption is still rare as of 2008 with those slides. But the more difficult it is for them to do targeted stuff with a dragnet data collection set, um, I think that tells us we're making progress. So we can actually measure it. And I sort of like to make a joke about Bill Hicks here and say that there's a war on your privacy and every time you use encryption you're winning it. And, and literally that seems to be the case with the slides that were released by The Guardian. So, these things actually make a difference. And so when you work on crypto software and you work on free software that can be verified and free hardware that can be verified, we actually are, we're actually making that, making that and changing it in a way that is in fact making a qualitative and quantitative difference in the way that these people can violate our rights. So we live in the golden age of surveillance, but it turns out that we can end it for the most part, unless we're wrong about all the crypto. Then we're fucked.
<laughs> so, are there any questions? No? Any? Yeah? Don't be shy. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Do, do you think um, that the Utah Data Center um, is built for uh, pumping up the space to uh, um, store all the data for uh, systems like Xcore? Yeah, so the question was about the Bluffdale NSA complex, which is in Bluffdale, Utah. And I believe that the Bluffdale complex is what's called an MDR, or a massive data repository, which is basically a gigantic hard drive farm it, it seems to have something, I think it was Dan Bernstein said it's like 35 megawatts of power. Uh, Warren Buffett owns the power, uh, power station nearby. Um, I doubt it's a green power station. Um, this guy's just evil thrown through on accident, I'm sure. But um, they seem to just want to store data there. And there seems to be a lot of interconnection going there, so presumably that will be, um, you know, that's like your uh, data special line. That's like for the planet. It's the planetary version. Something like 100 years of data, I believe, is the goal, uh, is what I've heard thrown around. So the thing is that there is MDR 1, 2, and 3 that I know about, at least. That's only one. So good news, it's only three. <laughs> Maybe. You had a question? Okay. Hello? Um, Hello. My question is regarding the FPGAs. Um, uh, are you trusting Altera and so on, or are you planning to do your own uh, production? I'm not planning to fab any FPGAs uh, at all. I, I mean, I, I am interested in the, the ability to make free hardware, but uh, I doubt that I'm ever going to actually open my own fab. But how, how we are supposed to trust Altera and so on with these uh, FPGAs? I mean, they could be compromised as well. So and there are even uh, fewer uh, manufacturers for that, so it's kind of much easier uh, attack for the agencies. So I won't answer that question, but Sebastian, I'm sure, will if he wants to come up here. And I would say that we shouldn't let perfection be the enemy of good enough. Right? right now, we're pretty sure that there is a way to update Intel CPUs uh, microcode, because in fact there's a way to do that and it's supported by the Linux kernel and you see it, it's in all these different systems. So we know for sure that there's a way to update that stuff. We don't know for sure about FPGAs in that way, and there's also a clear path to doing it. And, you know, obviously people will find a way to hack that kind of stuff, but we should try to think about the big picture, which is it's much easier to verify an FPGA than it is a proprietary CPU that's constantly changing all the time. So. Oh man, that's uncool. You have a phone. So I think PGA is it can be compromised, of course, but it's much harder to actually insert a backdoor inside an FPGA. I mean, a hardware backdoor. I mean, backdoor which is engraved into the chip itself uh, for two reasons. The first is that FPGAs are more flexible than CPUs. You can load many more different circuits in the FPGA, and it's at the, it's, it is at a very low level. So. They would have to like uh, have a the backdoor would be capable of analyzing very high level behavior from very low level behavior, and that's extremely difficult to do. And the second reason is that uh, when you look when you put an FPGA into an electron microscope, you see a very regular pattern. So, when you, but when you put a CPU, a CPU is just a lot of random logic. So when you want to insert a backdoor, and the backdoor has to be complicated for the reason I explained before, it would have to use a lot of transistors. It would have to use a lot of chip area. So it would be. Uh, much more visible on the electron microscope than if it was just some uh, little piece of logic in a CPU. But of course, it might be possible, but it's extremely difficult. So maybe the good answer is to manufacture your own chips, which is also possible, but also quite hard. So FPGS for now is still a pretty good solution, I would say. So that woman had her hand up, and then I think I'm done with questions. Let's finish. Let's do it later. Yeah, are you sure? She's the Let's only woman to ask a question. I really feel like we should let her answer. Jake, we know that you can answer questions for four hours. I'm not going to answer for four hours, but I'm hoping it's for Sebastian. The question? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's a more general question. Um, like, you know, with all the things going on, what's the agenda? Like, business people, they tend to divide agenda into like, you know, we have a 10 days goal, a 10 month goal, and a 10 years goal. 
So, yeah, I know it's like very business crap and everything, but um, just, you know, there's so much discussion going on and, and you say so much about like, you know, Germany's kind of keeping the discussion alive. Yep. So, I mean, they're, they're, they, I'm, I'm a bit worried that it's just going to die off, you know, because the, the conversation is so complex and it takes so long, like, you know, you have Snowden sacrificing yourself and, and you know, like pushing the debate. But that'll go for, for just so long, and that's not end. I don't know the answer to your question. Sorry, we can talk. But you know, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that there are many different goals, and the free software goal is a, it's a, it's a, it's a human achievement goal. It's a, it's a forever goal, and we need it immediately, and we need to improve on it immediately. The same is true for hardware, and the same is true for the networks that we build. And I think in the short term, we have almost all of this right now, but it's only hackers that can really make it work. So in the next couple of years, we should make it so that it's generally available to people, so that we have a solution that a policymaker, for example, or a business person can turn into a business plan or an actual strategic goal for a country that doesn't have to be kept secret, that people will respect, that respects their liberty. And that's a much bigger conversation, I think, than I would even want to try to have right now. But it's also the question, I guess, is to yourself, which is like, what do you want to do as part of the goals that are being outlined tonight? And whatever that is, if you want to help us do business development on this stuff, I'm sure you can imagine some of us have no clue about that. Um, so we could use help. So if that's the division of labor that you fall into and you want to help with that, please come and talk with us about it. Thanks. My turn? So first I want to let you know I've got some things for sale like uh, for the Free Software Foundation, that is. For instance, we have these little round metal stickers that say GNU slash Linux inside, and they're two euros. And you can help support our work by buying these, and also help support us by putting them in places where people see them. Anyway, uh, the basic idea of free software is that's the way you can have freedom inside your own computer. Because it's free as in freedom. We, it's frei, not kostenlos. Always has been. Although it took me a few years to realize that this distinction was central and that I should focus on it explicitly. So, free software means that the user has the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for whatever purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program operates and does your computing the way you wish. With these two freedoms, each user has individual control over what she does with that program. But individual control is not enough. Most users are not programmers. We also need collective control. So we need two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is the freedom to redistribute exact copies, and freedom three is the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions. You add these two freedoms, and now any group of users can work together to exercise control over what the program does for them, and the group can offer copies to other people as well. So, with free software, the users control the program. If the program is not free, that means the program controls the users, which is an injustice, because there's always somebody that controls the program. We typically call it the owner. It might be the developer, who knows. The point is, the owner controls the program, and the program controls the users, which means this program is an instrument giving the owner unjust power over the users. This is why non-free software should not exist. So the aim of the free software movement is no more non-free software. We want to liberate everyone in cyberspace. Now, if, you ha if people are using... If somebody's using free software, and if somebody's using only free software, that doesn't mean he is stopped from doing anything wrong. No, it means that he has control over what his computer does. So, for instance, if a doctor's office uses free software, it means 
that it's not being controlled by some company, that doesn't mean the doctor can't use the software to lie. Uh, he, he shouldn't. Uh, if it would be a crime to defraud people, I hope he gets prosecuted. This is one of the things that makes it so important to have a state that's just. But we can't expect free software to stop people from doing wrong with their own computers. Because the point of free software is to stop them from being subjugated by somebody else inside their own computers. So free software eliminates one of the injustices in life. But it doesn't mean that nobody can do anything wrong. Free software means we can exercise control of our software. It doesn't guarantee that there are no bugs or no malicious features in the software. It means we're in a position to take the effort to get rid of them. At least we're not helpless. The users of a non-free program are totally defenseless. If Microsoft wants to put something evil into Windows, if Apple wants to put something evil into the eye things, the users are helpless. They're defenseless. Now, when Canonical puts spyware into Ubuntu, at least the users are not helpless and defenseless. They can make a modified version of that software, which doesn't spy on them, and I'm sure they have. The point is, free software doesn't magically make all software be okay. But it means that since we are in control, we can make it okay. Or at least we have the, we're in a position to try. Which is much better than not being in a position to even try. So we've got to insist on free software, but that doesn't magically guarantee there's nothing bad in the world. Meanwhile, that concerns what happens inside your computer. But we also use the internet. And there are good and bad ways to use the internet. There are dangerous things that can happen to you if you use the internet, like uh, various services might demand that you hand over personal information which, for the most part, you just shouldn't do. Uh, <clears throat> but on the, nowadays, there are lots of ways you could buy things over the Internet, and they basically all require you to identify yourself, so I don't do them. I'm just not going to fall into uh, surrendering to surveillance in that way. So I buy things in stores and I pay cash. Uh, anyway, it would be really good if we could buy things over the internet and not identify ourselves. Well, there are two kinds of things you could buy. You could buy access to some information, or you could buy a physical thing. Buying access to information is easier, because all you need for that is an anonymous way to pay for it. Nowadays, often they don't even ask people to pay for it. They track people instead so that they can uh, get paid for advertising and the more they track people the more they get paid for the advertising and the whole thing is disgusting now i don't really care if i see an ad but i will not i will not let them track me so today what that means is i better not let any ads appear on my computer whether i look at them or not uh, but if, they could, if we could pay them instead, and pay them in an anonymous way, then sites could make money for whatever it is they publish, and they wouldn't have to mistreat us. So this is something very important for a free, for a freedom-respecting internet. Uh, another bad thing that, that sites, that services can do, that most people don't even think about still, is service as a software substitute. The evil thing about, in other words, SaaS, although, of course, SaaS to other people means software as a service, and that's what I used to call it. And then I realized people didn't understand what that meant. So I found a better expansion for the abbreviation, service as a software substitute. It's doing something in somebody else's server, which you should be doing by running a program in your own computer. Now, when can you do a job by running a program in your own computer? When it's 
operating on your data or data that you've got in your computer and it doesn't involve talking to anybody else so if you had the right program you could just run it and it would give you the answer that you want so that's computing that's yours it's yours personally it it's something that you can and therefore should have total control over there are other things we do in computing which are joint activities like if I want to talk with you well that's not something I could do by myself you're going to be involved that's a joint activity it's not just mine and therefore there's no reason why I should expect to have total control over it you could just as well be the one who should have total control over it right uh, so when an activity involves multiple people you can't demand to have full control over it not in general but when it's only yours when no one else is involved then you should have total control over it but if you entrust the computing to the software in somebody else's server then you have no control over it then she has total control over your computing and that's the injustice of SAS. Of course, there's also the issue of whatever data about you other computers on the net uh, end up with, whether because they're doing surveillance on you or because they demand you give them the information and you want the service so badly you tell them a bunch of things about you, like your name, your address. Uh, well now you're feeding the surveillance <clears throat> to the extent that we can do things peer-to-peer -peer, that's good that's the best way to do things so that there's no server where anyone is collecting a lot of data but when we can't do something peer-to-peer -peer, at least we should minimize the amount of information the server ever gets I used to be able to use Google Maps until about two or three years ago and then it broke and the reason it broke is I won't run the non-free JavaScript code that it sends I, I, I just deactivate JavaScript all the time unless I can actually see the code and decide that it's free or that it's trivial but uh, it used to be that Google Maps would work with JavaScript deactivated and then it stopped working with JavaScript deactivated. Everything would appear except the map itself, which wasn't too useful. But anyway, when it worked, I would never type in an address. I wouldn't tell it which place I was interested in. I'd just say, such and such city. And then I would scroll around and I would look. I would see the place I was looking for, but Google wouldn't know what place I was looking for. Now you could imagine a local client program, which should be free software of course, that would do this job. It would, down, it would pull in the map data for the region you're interested in, and it would locally find the address you want, and it would show you on the screen where that is, but it would never tell any map server what address it was. <clears throat> That's an example of designing to give away the least possible personal information while getting the job done. And of course, if it also did caching, then, it then the, the server wouldn't even know all the times that you get interested in a particular city. The point is, it wasn't designed to minimize that up. Inform that information, just the opposite. Google designed it to make it attractive and appealing to put in as much information as possible so Google would get as much information as possible. But when we redesign the internet, we need to think about this. We need to design uh, the various useful programs that involve getting data from the internet so as to not reveal information about what it is you want to do. Now, I talked about uh, selling access to data, but selling physical goods is a useful thing too. 
And once we have an anonymous payment system, it wouldn't really be very hard to sell physical goods too. Now, they couldn't ship the goods to your address. If you tell them your address, you've told them effectively who you are, but it doesn't have to go to your address. There are lots of local stores that sell lots of things, and they have some space to hold things. Well, why don't they say, you want to buy something on the internet? Come here, we'll give us cash, we'll order it. Here's a receipt. When it's here, come in and get it. Now, in fact, they're starting to do this for Amazon in some countries. For instance, in England, Amazon ships to one of these stores and the store will hold it for you. But you should never buy anything from Amazon. Look at stolman.org slash amazon.html. Amazon mistreats independent bookstores, authors, publishers, its workers, the treasury, and readers. So the point is, if stores can do this for Amazon, they could do this for anyone selling on the internet. It's a problem of engineering society. You could almost call it social engineering, except that means something else. Here I'm not talking about tricking anybody, I'm talking about engineering the way business is set up and functions. But it could certainly be done. So there are many issues of freedom affecting digital technology. Some of them apply to systems that we don't have anything to do with. In the UK, they've put so many cameras by the side of the road that they track all car travel. And they can track any car in real time, and they build up a dossier of the movements of every car, and they could be keeping that for 10 or 50 years. Well, we can't stop that by changing the way our computers work. We can't stop that by changing how the internet works. We can only stop that by political organizing <clears throat> or by destroying all the cameras. But uh, if the police are active, that might not be able to get started. So uh, we need to organize to defend our freedom. Now, there are many things we need the state to do. We need the state to provide food for those who are hungry, provide medical care for everyone, and above all, tax the rich to pay for it. <clears throat> so when I propose an anonymous payment system, I want it to be anonymous for whoever's paying, but not for whoever's receiving the money. The web shop doesn't need to be able to hide how much money it pulls in. It's the customers who should be anonymous. We want the web shop to pay its taxes. In fact, one of the big uh, legal issues of our time is how to, stop, how to change the system of tax laws that has been set up to make it easy for companies and the rich to uh, shift the profits around so that they don't pay any taxes. And I've proposed a system of taxation that would correct this problem. Uh, I believe there's a link to it on stallman.org somewhere, but in any case, the idea is you do, uh, you tax companies' gross revenue, not their profits. And you do it with a tax rate that increases as the size of the company goes up. And you compute the size of the company considering all its foreign affiliates as well. And all the companies that are really part of one structure, you just treat it as one in order to compute the size of the company, which determines the tax rate. And the bigger the company is, the higher the tax rate it pays, which will give small companies an advantage over big companies, which is very desirable. We want to make the big companies split up so that, they're, so that they can't be too big to jail, as is happening. The, the U.S. government admits it has declined to prosecute some criminal companies because they were too big to jail. So 
we need a democratic state. Democracy is a system whereby the many who are not rich join together so that together they're stronger than the rich. Now, many countries have the forms that we consider democratic, but most of them are not democratic in substance. They're working for the, the rich, which means they're plutocracies. So, of course, they're unjust, and they lead to massive poverty and massive unemployment. But if we didn't have a state, there would be very little to hold back the rich. So what we need is a state that's democratic, a state that works for the non-rich and actually enables us to limit the power of the rich to do to us whatever they wish. So <clears throat> I've campaigned for 30 years now, which is not qu almost 30 years. So it's not quite as long, I believe, as Jacob has been alive, but it's a long time uh, for free software. I do not campaign for open anything. That term is a mistake. It leads thought in the wrong direction. Because open is a weak word. It sounds nice, but it doesn't it doesn't raise the issue of your freedom. So, in terms of rhetoric, it's a way people can make a cause that sounds nice and avoids the important issue. And in the discussions in our field, you'll find some people talk about free software and freedom, others prefer the word open, usually because they don't want to talk about freedom and others who do care about freedom say open because they feel they have to let they have to go along with the current although this debilitates them as supporters of freedom because they're not making that point in a clear way so if you think that freedom is a central issue here please say free frei libre some word that that refers to freedom. And the less you say open, the better. I once uh, signed a statement in favor of, quote, open access, unquote, in scientific publication. Because in substance, the definition was right. It included the a demand to let people republish, redistribute the papers, and do other useful things with them. So I thought, well, the substance is right, even though the term focuses on a secondary point, namely the, whether the original publication site will let anybody download the article. Uh, still, because the substance was right, I supported it. And what I saw happen after that was the meaning drifted to align with the words that they were using. They forgot about the more powerful requirement that people have to be free to redistribute, and they, laws were being passed in favor of, quote, open access, unquote, which only said that the publication site has to allow access by everyone. And then I realized, I can't support, quote, open access, unquote, anymore because it no longer stands for the right meaning. So I support uh, <clears throat> freedom respecting scientific publishing. We've got to, in addition to campaigning for the specific things that defend our freedom in specific issues, we have to say free and freedom as often as possible. We have to formulate the specific issues explicitly in terms of how they relate to freedom so that we direct society's thinking towards a focus on freedom. So if you want to buy something from the FSF, please come and see me. And 
If you have some money to give to the cause, you could join the Free Software Foundation or Free Software Foundation Europe or both. And there are some FSF and GNU stickers over there. No Q&A? I guess I can answer questions if you want me to. <laughs> Anyone questions? You have a... Oops. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi, Richard. Um, nice talk, thank you. Okay, um, uh, I'll try to make this brief. Uh, I mean, we all know that there are lots of people in the world who willingly use non-free software. They use Apple products, they use Microsoft Windows. Um, you said initially at the beginning of your talk that it is your wish to have a future in which such software does not exist. Um, given that so many people voluntarily use it, which... Well, they do it because of the set of alternatives that have been offered to them. So you can see this as, as a reflection of social inertia. For instance, you can see this especially with Windows. Many people use Windows because when they buy computers, Windows is in them already. And because what they, when they go to school, the school teaches them to use Windows and maybe even demands they use Windows and they work in a place and the employer tells them to use Windows. This is social inertia. Okay, well that doesn't address what I was going to ask. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, let's forget about the ones who, I mean, the school example where they are under some sort of coercion. Let's talk only about the people who choose by themselves to use the software. Um, the fact that they use this, if, if, there is, if, if this is evidence for anything, it's that they don't consider that freedom to be valuable. I'm sure there are people who don't. Yeah, okay, what's the question? Um, wh how do you reach the conclusion that, that a world without uh, non-free software is a better one, given that people think Oh, well, prefer... this has nothing to do with it, right? A person with foolish values prefers something that's bad who are that has no see? relevance to what I want to see. Yeah, but who are you to say that their values are, are foolish? Sorry, what? Who are you to say that their values are foolish? I'm me. Who else do I need to be? I can have an opinion as much as they can. All right, so as long as it's just an opinion. But well, then, then right. I, I well, the point to... is, when I, I hope you'll share my opinion, and I hope together we will aim for a world which doesn't have proprietary software in it. How about a world that has a maximum of choice in it? I'm not interested in maximum of choice. Okay. Freedom is not measured by number of choices. It's not measured by the number of options. That's a common fallacy, but that definition of freedom leads to absurd results. Freedom is having control of your own life. Now, a slave today might have more choices than a free peasant 500 years ago. But that doesn't mean that that peasant was more of a slave than the slave today because freedom is not a matter of how many choices you've got. Now, a billionaire has more choices available than I do. Does that mean the billionaire is more free than I am? Does that mean, well, because if you believe that, then either you have to give up the idea that all people deserve freedom or you have to demand a, an extreme kind of communism that even communist countries didn't try to establish. <laughs> so, uh, you, it's fundamental misunderstanding of the concept of freedom to try to define it in terms of how many options people have. When the, when the energy people spoke about the Green Revolution, they're always speaking about a decentralized system. They always say we can only change energy and the dependency of the energy companies if we have a decentralized. And the only breakthrough that people started putting their solar panels on their houses was when there was financial subsidies, really changing That's something. That's fine with me. I'm in favor so my of financial question is, subsidies. So you, you think it's a good idea to have financial subsidies for free software? Sure. Okay. You know, GNU ADA was the GNU ADA compiler was funded by the U.S. Air Force. 
and the contract for its development said that when it was done it would be given to the Free Software Foundation. We were quite happy to accept this. The software is still maintained actually by a company, a free software company, uh, which I'm very happy about as well. And the fact that the funding came from the military doesn't bother me in the slightest. Uh, uh, the biggest problem is uh, at the moment, the uh, uh, biggest challenge for the free software is uh, the hardware and the uh, drivers. Uh, I, I find it important, uh, this uh, free hardware um, project. Uh, well, how, okay. how do you want to solve this problem? Because, Please, uh, look, there, you're, there's a confusion here. I don't talk about free hardware. I talk about documented hardware. Hardware that we can run without proprietary software. And the reason is, from my point of view, I'm dependent on hardware made by some manufacturer. Maybe in 50 years, maybe in less time, who knows, we'll have personal fabricators and, we'll, and we won't be dependent on mass-produced hardware. But I'm not trying to think that far ahead. I don't try to think very far ahead. This is a, dis a policy decision. I realize that I don't know what's going to happen in 10 years, and I'm not in a position to carry out a 10-year plan, so I don't bother making one. It would, I have enough other stuff to do. If you handed me an army, I would say, all right, now I could carry out a plan, I should make one. But I don't have an army. I have the opportunity to talk to a bunch of people who might or might not do what I ask them to do. And so in these situations, my ability to shift what anyone is doing is very vague and limited. So I can't make and carry, I, don't, I can't carry out any sort of complicated plan, so I don't bother. What I, and, and as for the problems of future technology, I figure we'll solve them in the future using future technology. We don't need to worry about them today. So today what I'm aiming for is to have computers we can run without using proprietary software. And what appears to be necessary is reverse engineering. So for some time now, I've been emphasizing the importance of reverse engineering, asking people, to, if you want to contribute something big to our community, do reverse engineering of peripherals. Figure out uh, how to run them. And I suggest to universities that they start classes in reverse engineering uh, so as to uh, produce more people who know how to do this and will do this. So this is my, you might say, long-term, not exactly plan, but effort to push things in the direction where we can do better at this. Hi, one question. Um, well, obviously having free software is a solution to many of the problems we face today, but having the NSA using free software for the X key score pro for the X key score program and the military use free software for a lot of their programs, shouldn't we exclude them? No, that would in free software. That would destroy the free software community. Free software must not limit what job people are doing with it. We can't tolerate in our operating systems programs that limit what job they can be used for because then we have a system where depending on what it is you plan to do, various programs might not be allowed for you to use. And this system would be impossible for anyone to use. And the other thing is, it's no, of no benefit to us if the US military uses Windows instead. <laughs> it's stupid for them, but it's no benefit to our freedom. It doesn't help us in any way. 
And besides, if we did put on such limits, A, they wouldn't be legally valid, B, they would ignore them or they'd change the laws if the laws actually got in their way, and uh, it just wouldn't do us any good. All we would do is destroy ourselves. We must insist that we don't accept, we don't regard a program as acceptable unless people can use it for absolutely whatever they like. You suggested that people go into a store instead of buying online. And now we've got them on tape. And two times, one time for the receipt and one time well, to pick it up. Well, the security camera should not be on the internet. <laughs> security cameras should not be on the internet, period. But in any case, the possibility of using face recognition to tell who those people are is a big threat to our privacy, and it's one that we can't solve by redesigning our own computers. This is a place where we need the state to, do, to work for us. Security cameras should be strictly limited in terms of not being on the internet and saving their data for only a certain amount of time before it's destroyed, and the and, and no one else should be able to get that data without going to a court to justify it. I uh, one small question. I don't know if it, you're the right one to address. Um, I learned at school some basic assembler programming for traffic lights as practice and some object oriented programming in Java. If I want to help in developing free communication structures and if, uh, stuff, which language would you it's not an interesting question. Programming is programming. If you get good at programming, it doesn't matter which language you learn it in because you'll be able to do programming in any language. The hard part of programming is the same regardless of the language. And if you have a talent for that and you learn it here, you can take it over there. Hi, I would like to ask a question about fundamental... Well, but one thing, if you want to get a picture of programming at its most powerful, you should learn Lisp or Scheme, because they're more elegant and powerful hey, than other languages. So, sorry for the person who was starting to ask another question. You please start no again. Problem. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, in the past, the uh, technical communities uh, took a lot of emphasis on enlightening the individual to use certain things and to do certain things and to be able to. Uh, do that's so things. abstract. I don't know what it means. Yeah, and could you be concrete? Uh, yes, most of the uh, most of the things that have been proposed to make the world a better place in technical communities have been stuff that individuals would do. And in your talk, you. You, uh, put a lot of I don't know. On I still that. rather it's still rather abstract, and I don't know whether anything I've ever said was of that kind. Okay. But yeah, there's a lot of I've seen efforts to try to demystify computing and other technology. I think it's a good thing, but it's totally different from what I'm doing. Okay. Can I try to rephrase the question? Yeah. Uh, do you think it was wrong to put so much emphasis on individuals instead of trying to do mass action? I don't know. I mean, I won't say it, it sounded was, like it. I won't. No, I mean, I won't say it was wrong to try to help more people understand what computers really do. Uh, it's good for people to be more educated. It's not everything we need, however. When people, there's, there's a lot, especially in the U.S., there's a big pressure against the idea that people should join together to do something. Uh, I suppose it comes from the propaganda of the plutocrats. Uh, they don't want people doing things like having a union. So uh, they, they try to... They, they try to make the idea of working together to get anything seem radical, shocking, frightening, so that people will be pushed into just doing individual activity. There was once a radio call-in program 
which was discussing what people could do to get better pay and working conditions, and but they meant implicitly what they could do individually. So I called in and said, how about talking about forming a union? That's a good way to get better pay and working conditions. And they said, oh, we've defined this to be outside the topic. Goodbye. <laughs> Well, now, it may not be so bad here, but that's the way it is in the U.S. And, of course, a lot of the computing got big first in the U.S. So a lot of those efforts towards demystifying computers for non-professionals were done in the U.S. first. And they were probably influenced by this attitude. Well, when I, um, in, my, in my high school graduation yearbook, I wrote I wanted to become a computer engineer uh, be, be, before later uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. And um, uh, I, I, gave my, I gave myself 60 years uh, um, for, for the first job task. And, uh, but back then, I could only enroll for, com for computer science. And all I learned was uh, this is impossible, this is impossible, this is complex. There are certain problems that are intractable, even for computers, uh, um, uh, even if they're parallel, multi-core, and... Uh, yeah, that's right. There are some. In fact, cryptography depends on the fact that some of them are so hard. Yeah, but the thing is, my brain is... Uh, uh, um, I consider my brain also a computer, um, uh, which has some advantages over... Uh, <laughs> we don't know how the brain works. Yeah. We can't make something that works that way today. It's... Uh, um, uh, um, um, I agree with that. Um, so my problem is, um, um, I love I, uh, I I love your I love your ideas. I love your mission. I I, I totally I wholeheartedly agree with uh, what you say. Um, but I need uh, to 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 enhance software, to read software, to understand software. I I, I, I as a human with with a limited brain, I need help. Why is there no wiki GNU org? Uh, where the source code is documented in, in Donald... Uh, well, listen, news. the document, the explanation for the source code is in the comments. Yeah. And any GNU package maintainer will accept a change consisting of comments that are useful for explaining the code. But we can't make people write those comments. Um, we can't make people do anything. We can't, but perhaps put a, put a wiki up. Look, the po we, no, no. The point is, we want these explanations to be in the code. Yeah, and the so send the comments to the maintainer to be installed in the code. They'll they'll do it. Someone just has to write them. I am a maintainer myself, and I I didn't have the time to put to to fill in all the things that that people sent to me. Real, you couldn't make use of all the changes they were sending I, I you? Could, I, I could. They, they were useful changes, but I didn't have the time to... to well, you'll get to it eventually, right? I mean, it, I don't know. It would have been easier if they could have helped... If they could have helped... <coughs> have Excuse the me, gentlemen. Well, it's an idea I can think about. Maybe have a wiki have in parallel after, with the code. After the event, maybe you better have a talk after okay. the event now. Okay. It's a, one-on-one -on -one conversation right now. That's what it's been so, uh, one last question. <laughs> Maybe if I may. So. Okay, let me take the stance of the, uh, the side. The other side, you're saying uh, we need the free code and everything, and you'd rather have customers being anonymous without giving code information to anybody. This takes away the possibility for the business model for many uh, businessmen. Yep, that's the point. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so that's far, so good. So far, so good. But I'm ask, my question is, on your website, do you, can you give them a text that gives them alternatives? I mean, I make them care. rethink. Make them rethink. I, I don't, I'm not trying to convince them. They're the last people in the world I could convince. Mm -hmm. And I got better things to do. Uh, I learned about 25 years ago not to spend a lot of time trying to convince somebody whose mind is made up. That the effective thing for me to do it when I discover that somebody's mind is made up is talk to someone else instead. And so 
I'm not going to try to convince the people who are making money from surveillance that they should switch to something else. I'll, because it's too unlikely to succeed. So I'd rather try to convince other people to do other things. So, uh, thank you, Richard, for being so patient to answer all those questions. And if you want to buy something, just come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thorsten, right now. Hey guys, I know you're all tired, so I will be really, really quick. I'm Thorsten from the Free Software Foundation Europe. So we are like the European sister organization from Richard's FSF. So I see there is like a lot of interest in this topic, and if you guys want to talk more about it in a different setting, we meet once a month, and the events are uh, announced on fsfe.org. So if you want to join there, it's always the second Thursday of each month, and currently we're meeting close to Ostkreuz. So uh, I would love to see all of you there at our meetings. Thank you very much for being here today. Maybe that. All right. Uh, okay, it was my job uh, to open the event, so I think it's also my job to close it right now. Um, thank you for being such a good audience and give me a big uh, applause for all speakers and all lectures here tonight. Feel free to uh, stay with us for a drink and having a talk and I wish you a good night and a good way home.